Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the workshop on Building Trust in Public Health Emergency Preparedness and Response, or FEPR, science. And in this session, we will be focusing on the infrastructure and workforces that support ongoing human interactions through which trust in science can form. My name is Monica Shaksmana. I am a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security and a senior scientist at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and I'll be moderating this session. To begin, I'm going to ask, some, ask everyone to imagine the Brooklyn Bridge. You West Coasters can think of the Golden Gate. Uh, Midwesters can think of, I think it's the Mackinac Bridge. But the Brooklyn Bridge spans the East River and it connects Brooklyn and Manhattan. And the two main structures or towers, which weigh 90,000 tons each, are made of limestone, granite, and Rosendale cement. And the cables of the suspension bridge contain 14,000 miles of wire. It's 140 years old and it still shuttles about 150,000 vehicles, pedestrians, and cyclists on an average day. So why am I asking you to imagine a bridge for this session? Because you cannot wish a bridge into existence. And the same is true of public trust and public health emergency preparedness and response science, no matter how intangible that sentiment appears uh, at first glance. Bridges and trusts are both about connection and they both result from human creativity, intention, planning, hard work, ample investment, quality standards, adaptation to local landscape, and ongoing monitoring and maintenance. And that's why I'm asking you to imagine a bridge. A bridge requires design and it pulls stone and steel together and trust requires a deliberate conscious bonding between community and public health. Organizing questions for our session include uh, one such as this, what funding structures, organizational forms, and able workforces are needed to support authentic connections between communities and public health. We have a wonderful and interesting panel. Um, the panelists represent a range of experiences. Uh, we'll ha have both the perspective of communities and public health. I'm going to invite each speaker to share their remarks uh, each one has about five minutes to speak, and then we will open up um, the conversation for a question and answer period. Now, if you'd like more information about each of the panelists, please, there is a link to their bios, uh, which is posted on the event webpage. And if you have a question to ask the panel, then please put it in the question and answer window in Slido, which is beneath the video player. So without further ado, I'd like to turn to our first panelist, Dr. Umer Shah, who is the Secretary of Health at the Washington State Department of Health. Umer, you have the floor. Thank you, Monica. Thank you um, again for the kind invitation. And I uh, was, as part of our, our panel, reminded that we had the five minutes. So I'm going to do my best to, to stay within that. And uh, it's great to see everybody uh, virtually, and it's an, an incredible opportunity to present some of the things that we've been doing in the state of Washington. And I, I just really want to, I, I have some slides that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show, but what I wanted to really start with is the real concern around uh, uh, confidence and trust and building that confidence and trust we know is, is hard work. It's, it's a, a longitudinal work. It's not, it doesn't happen overnight, but, but losing that confidence, losing that trust can happen very quickly. And I think that is one of the challenges that we've seen in our country. What I um, want to do is really describe a little bit of the, the narrative that we've had at the state of Washington. And just let me know, uh, Monica, if you can see the, my, my slides, just to make sure. Um, yes, coming through. Thank you. And as you know, previously I was in Texas for a significant amount of my public health career down in Houston. And I came uh, December uh, 2020, was asked by Governor Inslee to become the Secretary of Health for the great state of Washington. And it was four days after vaccines arrived in our state. And as you can imagine, it's been a very challenging time 
during this period of time overall is as part of how we've been addressing needs in our community. Our cornerstone values at the department, uh, these three I think resonate with everybody, equity, innovation, and engagement. And the real importance of that work, especially at a very political time. And as you know, public health is inherently political and yet this challenge of uh, politicizing public health has been even more so over the last two years than, than we have seen. Yet I would dare say this has been a manifestation of, of broader than public health. It's really been um, at many times just a, a, an inability for society to truly be able to dialogue with each other or across lines. Lines and, and unfortunately, public health is caught oftentimes in the middle of that. So building trust and confidence is very much about one of the challenges that we've been looking at as, as how do we do this well. And we found that much of that work is very much about uh, getting to the community rooted organizations and uh, those organizations really allow us to to invest in communities especially culturally and linguistically diverse communities and we have done that uh, in a number of different ways. One is through our Power of Provider Initiative, which is really bringing our healthcare providers into the fold with our SAVE uh, moniker to really uh, ask them to help us get uh, trust back in for individuals to be vaccinated. And certainly it's one thing to talk to your healthcare or talk with your healthcare providers, but it's also another thing to be able to be in the community on the ground. And that has been our caravan efforts, which really these mobile units to be able to go and reach people where they are in the actual neighborhoods where they are. So we could, for the first time at a state level, have the opportunity to be uh, able to get to communities and not just rely on our partners themselves. And that has been really very important as part of an overall goal with a task force that has really allowed us to bring a whole host of partners and, and community members together so we can engage those very communities as we move forward in a culturally and linguistically appropriate way. But that really isn't just about talking the talk, it's walking the walk and not just by by talking and walking and working with your healthcare providers or getting in the community, it's about investment. And I think one of the biggest challenges is that we just do not invest enough in from an equity um, driven approach. Uh, we put uh, our monies through a vaccine implementation collaborative with, with millions of dollars that were invested in community rooted organizations, as well as broader media work. And those very communities that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 are the very communities that have also been targeted by much of that misinformation and disinformation. And so our social media and our traditional media efforts also have to work hand in hand with the efforts on the ground. And the community groups, as you can see in this list here is significant and the and the diversity and broadness of those groups is significant and why it's so important that it's an all in approach as we look forward and when um i i do say in it together but i i will say the one thing that is is very much about what we're looking at is our plan to move forward is is very much about uh, bringing all of the summation of the efforts that we have put forth in our new WAF forward plan that we have um, released just a, a week and a half ago that really describes the steps that the state of Washington is going to take to move forward. But equity, 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 in addition to innovation and engagement is an absolutely important key piece of the work ahead. So I just think that we have to really be thinking about building trust um, it takes a long time. It's hard, but losing trust can happen overnight. And our job is to continue to build that trust, but we have to invest alongside with it. Thank you, Monica. I'll turn it back. Thank you so much, Umair. Um, and thank you for concretizing, uh, concretizing the work and also the high stakes of this type of work. Um, next, uh, I'd like to welcome Isabel Duron, who's president and executive director for the Latino Cancer Institute. Isabel, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Monica, to the assembly and to this panel. I'm pleased to be here and thrilled to hear Dr. Shaw's plans. Uh, he's on the right path. I have a colleague from the Mission District of San Francisco. It's a postage stamp of a community, one and a half miles of Latino history, culture, and languages, which became a Petri dish for COVID. And the community itself of 25,000 and its 29 plus grassroots organizations 
rose up to save themselves, where infections among those tested in the early days of the pandemic were at 90 percent, the majority essential workers. I recall my colleague there saying in the fall of 2020, we can't go back to normal because normal is what got us here in the first place. So here we are again. Slide, please. These words, my slide, are we looking at it, please? It's, thank you. These words, if not us, who, if not now, when? They evolved from a quote of Rabbi Hillel the Great from over 2,000 years ago, while others credited President Ronald Reagan for a variation on the theme, as well as Congressman John Lewis, a disruptor in his own lifetime, who often called us uh, on our called us to bring out our better angels. And this who and when question goes hand in hand with this particularly favorite cartoon of mine, which I have showcased for any number of years now, cartoonist Aaron Bacall in the Atlantic Magazine that captures our ongoing failure to disrupt because we are stuck. I saw a very moving tribute on CNN recently, which showcases the pain of the Ukrainian people and the bravery and resilience demonstrated by regular citizens determined to protect their democracy and freedom from tyranny and oppression. And as they stepped up the plate to volunteer, no one was asking them for credentials. This is their moment and they are rising to the occasion. We can lose the slide. Community-based organizations, particularly those run by communities of color, are a reflection of the loss of belief in the system because they had to continually build out their own to respond to their own identified needs because systems were not listening or they failed them. But now that these organizations are built, whether defined as grassroots, community-based organizations, it would be beneficial for public health academic, other social and civic organizations to engage and partner with these community systems by, I think Dr. Shaw pointed out, equitable investments uh, in their effort to rebuild that trust and build that bridge in those infrastructures and to face a more certain than I believe changed future for everybody. And even during COVID, we saw social health and civic si systems struggle with what to do and how to do it, while communities called for help and they looked for leadership from those systems. So as part of Communivac, the national working group through Johns Hopkins that I've had a luxury of working with, with Monica, I've had a great opportunity to compare notes with or hear about others doing community work around the country and able to see the differences in opportunities and strategies to meet the need or not. In some cases, there might be a rich abundance of social and civic community agencies, and in other communities, a real paucity with a high dependence on one group like church ministry. So loosely knit or tightly bound the community itself, the community itself, the neighborhoods, the zip codes is a system. Within it are organizations that reveal or reflect the social, religious, civic functions that support that community, drive it, help it thrive, or if they hardly exist as in these rural communities, these community members struggle harder to survive on their own. Or as they did in Maine, we heard earlier, health systems partner with local groups to work on the problem together as they did from COVID. Let's just take research. Just yesterday, a colleague from the University of New Mexico said her research found that if CBOs were engaged in the research design and real world issues were identified, that health outcomes were improved. The pandemic has shown us that CBOs and their community health workers who partnered with public health systems to do outreach, education about testing and vaccination, were able to identify more infection, infection cases. Vaccine uptake was higher, as in the instance of the Latino Task Force in San Francisco, which helped collect critical testing data from the community and helped achieve an 87% vaccine uptake of the city and county's Latino population, the majority vaccinated and boosted. In San Jose, a group of Latino, this is California, a group of Latino community leaders banded together and worked with the county to oppose the state's decision to put vaccine distribution and guidelines in the hands of a state-run organization. In the end, seven counties signed this agreement with the state and kept control of their own established process. The San Jose group went one step further and they rested $200,000 from the county for a vaccine site in the Latino neighborhood, which was a well-known gathering place for this community. But the group had to press hard on the county to give them that money. And they had millions of dollars from COVID relief, the CARES Act and the state and, uh, and uh, federal funding. 
with hundreds of these millions of dollars, yet this resistance on the part of political leaders was not a sign of good faith, was not smart, pl a smart planning, nor was a signal to these communities that they were in fact equal community partners. Nor have I heard, and I'd like to hear from Dr. Shaw, have they been invited to the table to engage in this long-term pandemic response planning? Or are you going to do it and then go out there and tell them what you, what you did? So like Venus Hines, who said earlier, we're not waiting for history to repeat itself. We are working on our own plans to deal with oncoming health challenges, utilizing our community health workers. For long-term sustainability for community health, I see Monica is raising her hand already. <laughs> I need to say this, a county executive and an executive director of a community-based organization have to know the same things. Who are the customers or constituents they are serving? The demographic breakdown of those constituents, the types of services needed, offered, missing, or need scaling up. The amount of equity investment needed to address those concerns and the partners within those communities, either neighborhood to neighborhood or zip code to zip code who can come together to address problems holistically, not piecemeal to address reallocation of resources requires political will, the right community members at the table and an equitable amount of investment. How am I doing, Monica? Do I have a few more? Uh, why don't we take a break there and save okay. your comments for the Q&A uh, 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 section. Uh, I thank you for elevating the community system uh, so that it, it is on the same level as the public health system and the healthcare delivery system. I think we need to really embrace that uh, image. The, so thank you, Isabel. Our next panelist is Dr. Anita Chandra, Vice President uh, and Director for RAND Social and Economic Wellbeing with the RAND Corporation. Anita, please, you have the floor. Great, thanks, Monica, and thanks to the other panelists. I thought I would just kind of um, point to three um, critical areas that build on the prior comments and the prior sessions and, um, and really hit those points of, of reimagining the trust infrastructure for the future of public health that Monica outlined. Um, so one is, is certainly in the area that you heard Isabel talk about in terms of government and civil society relationships. Um, we know this from our work in emergency response and resilience that um, strong and continuous partnerships with civil society organizations matters. Uh, and certainly that integration with nonprofits, with business community was absolutely essential during the pandemic um, and obvious when it wasn't. Um, but, but I would argue that a couple of places need some strengthening in those conversations. One is kind of a new horizon in terms of how we are um, re-envisioning public health data. There have been some movements about transparency about data, how data are shared across these organizations, but probably less consideration of how civil society organizations are helping um, demonstrably and contextualizing those findings in the context of history and culture of the community and the active role of translating that data to action. There have been partnerships to look at data together. There are partnerships to present data together, uh, but in the um, areas of understanding context and translation that has been noticeably uneven across public health um, nationally. Another area for strengthening in that kind of civil society public health relationship is giving the tools for civil society organizations to communicate the value of public health today rather than using a playbook of a few years ago. What is that purpose? What is that narrative? What are the, um, the language and the terms that would resonate locally in terms of a value to community well-being? Uh, we have to kind of reimagine uh, those kinds of um, relational tools that will equip civil society organizations to use language that probably is not always as comfortable uh, with governmental uh, public health. A second area, in addition to those civil society government collaborations, is better allyship with other government partners. Even with strides that we've made in traditional public health, uh, you often talk to other agencies, and I work a lot with city governments who say, we can kind of coordinate amongst public works or economic development or transportation and the like, but we'll leave health to do what health does. There's still a discomfort, there's still a challenge of collaboration um, and, a, and an understanding and sometimes a misunderstanding of what is um, public health's remit. 
um, so that those other government agencies are a little bit more comfortable to describe the role of public health and the role that their actions are playing on the public health and vice versa. You've heard a lot of people talk about this mismatch where we were pitting health outcomes and economic outcomes uh, during the pandemic, and that was a false trade-off. Well, that's also a function of some of the lack of um, of community and shared narrative across agencies that, that health of often becomes siloed in those overall community stories. You know, to what extent is the mayor talking about um, the linkage between health, economics, and safety? How much is that the part of the state of the city speech or the state of the community speech every year? And then to what extent are we cross-training across government agencies? Are public health staff seconded to other departments and vice versa? Is that routine? And then finally, we've talked a lot today about the workforce comp composition. And I think we've got to really step back and, and go back to something that I heard earlier this morning, which is where is the public in actually understanding public health? And are we then training the workforce to understand that set point versus what we're using as our talking points? Um, and then in the context of equity, are there real competencies in our public health workforce that ultimately engenders trust. So it, ability to navigate cultural, social, and historical conversations, not just disparities conversations. How do you explain historical and structural factors in a way that engenders that trust and fosters that collaboration? Uh, we've not spent a lot of time in public health schools, as many of you know, talking about systems analysis in deep ways, talking about politics and history, and that needs to be embedded more going forward in terms of our workforce readiness. So with that, I'll turn it back to the panel. Thanks, Monica. Thank you so much, Anita. Uh, I appreciate you spotlighting the need to democratize data, uh, the need to develop and use local dialects of public health, uh, really hyper-local um, practice, uh, and then also inviting, uh, inviting uh, the intra-agency communities and other strategic allies to help represent public health um, to the larger community. So um, if I could welcome next uh, Jefferson Ketchell, who's the executive director for Washington State uh, Public Health Association. Uh, Jeff, we look forward to your comments. Uh, thank you so much, Monica. So wonderful to be here today. So WSPHA is the uh, Washington State affiliate of the American Public Health Association. Uh, before that, I was the director of a, of a couple of local health departments here in Washington State, and I've been working in public health for about 28 years. So I want to start with a question. So functional infrastructure and a trained, reliable workforce are of value. And those, those, those things ultimately require resources. So is that something your jurisdiction values? And if we trust things that we value, did public health have the trust before the pandemic? And therefore has, and then has the pandemic either earned or lost trust in public health? So I've been working on public health funding for the past decade here in Washington. And from 2000 to 2021 in Washington state, the public health system had unpredictable, unstable, and undedicated funding, much like most of the rest of the United States. Now, Washington State is a decentralized public health system, meaning we have state health department, Dr. Shaw, we have local health, uh, 35 different local health jurisdictions, uh, and tribal public health as well. And they all work together to deliver public health services. Uh, but over the last 10 years, the public health system in Washington has worked together with partners and elected officials to define what that public system, public health system ought to provide to all. And in 2021, the Washington State Legislature recognized that the public health system did not have the resources it needed to prevent disease and promote health. I think a lot of that was born out of, wow, look at this pandemic and look how our public health system was prepared um, by no fault of their own. And uh, so they made the largest investment in history, in Washington State history, uh, to fund what's called foundational public health services. And uh, a foundational public health service is something that is unique to government and should be provided to everybody. Uh, so now what? Um, so with this resource issue bridged, now we need to build and sustain and attract a public health workforce and really build up that infrastructure. So knowing that diseases happen in rural and urban jurisdictions alike, and you're only as healthy as your neighbor, 
Uh, how do we make sure this, this decentralized system here in Washington is well connected, has every, every jurisdiction has those minimal types of services and infrastructure and staffing that it needs to deliver those services. So some of the things that we're working on here in Washington, uh, many of us are working together, uh, is, is sort of on workforce development. Uh, and so some of these things include a school to work pipeline, how are we working with undergraduate and graduate public health and environment, my background is environmental health, environmental health programs uh, to make sure that we have the workforce of tomorrow and they're prepared. And a lot of this means internships, practicums, uh, opportunities for job shadowing and things, things like that to really make sure because there's a lot of money to be spent and there's a lot of positions that need to be filled and filled quickly. And so where are these people going to come from? Um, one of the things that we're afraid of is making sure that uh, rural, uh, some jurisdictions aren't, aren't necessarily stealing from other jurisdictions. So uh, I've worked in both rural and urban environments and the rural environments don't pay as well as some of the urban environments. And so how do we make sure that we're not bleeding a lot of these uh, jurisdictions dry with, uh, with their talent and workforce? So we need to make sure that there, what incentives do we wanna to provide to, for people to stay in rural environments? Um, what about upskill opportunities? Uh, I love the idea of community health workers being part of the public health workforce of today and tomorrow. How are we working with high schools and community colleges to really develop this and incorporate it into the, into the public health system? Uh, one thing that's come up nationally, and this has certainly been headlines over the past couple of years, is public health worker protection. If we're going to attract and sustain this workforce, uh, we must do something about doxing and keeping our public health workforce safe when they're at home and, uh, and things like that. Um, and then, um, and so also the, the lack of funding over the years has somewhat has caused some of the deprioritization of the things that are causing illness, injury, and premature death. And so what new competencies do, does our public health workforce need. So our, uh, our local association, our state association has declared racism as a public health crisis, much like a lot of uh, governmental public health agencies and associations have done. How are we now preparing our workforce to work in this arena to really understand equity, to really understand justice, to really understand the impacts of settler colonialism uh, on the health of our communities that we serve. And so I think there's a lot of training opportunities to help uh, even out. And I'll pass it back to Monica. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I really like that image of sort of the, the school to work pipeline and thinking about uh, uh, the today and tomorrow's generate next the next generation of public health workers um, and the revolutionary potential that exists uh, in shaping that that workforce. Um, so thank you. Our final panelist is Dr. Stephen Thomas, who is the director for the center for Health Equity at the University of Maryland. Um, uh, just a quick reminder, if you have a question to ask the panel, please put it in the Q&A window and slide up beneath the video player. Stephen, uh, please, uh, you have the floor to close out the panelist's comments. Thank you very, very much. I'm here for one reason, and that's to cause trouble, good trouble, and to introduce you to some new partners that I've met that are on the front lines of the pandemic fight. Uh, next slide. Now I'm gonna say some things you may not agree with uh, and these are complicated issues. So I hope that we can find ways to continue this conversation in ways that we can disagree without being disagreeable. But over the past 20 plus years, this is the work of our Center for Health Equity, building trust, building bridges, building healthy communities. Oh, I'm so glad to hear all this trust talk here and all this community engagement. But those of us who've been on these front lines, we're glad to be brought into the mainstream. It took a pandemic. Next. And so uh, it's some lessons that we've learned from our work with Communivax with our hyper-local approach I want to bring to you today. Next slide. And, and from the civil rights movement, next, just hit click. A lesson from Frederick Douglass. There are a lot of folks out there that want to keep the waters calm. There is no way we can keep these waters calm in the face of this pandemic. We need agitation. And we have lessons from the past of how to do that. Next slide. Most people don't know the history of barbers, shops, and beauty salons and health. 
But a brief review of the literature uncovers centuries of evidence dating back to the humble origins of dentistry and surgery. Barbershops and beauty salons are places of connection, conversation, and community. Barbers and stylists have trust of the people in their neighborhoods. Important conversations of the day are often discussed and debated in barbershops and beauty salons. So how might we make barbershops and beauty salons a place where conversations about health, delivery of medical services, and emergency preparedness interventions can actually take place. This is exactly what we did 20 years ago. Next slide. For many black and brown uh, communities, trust is more important than science, more important than academic credentials. A doctor may give great health advice, but they may not be aware that a barber or a stylist in the community with no medical degree but with decades of trust can override the doctor's advice. This situation begs the question, what if our neighborhood barbers and stylists could be partners in health? Over the past 12 years, the University of Maryland Center for Health Equity has leveraged our relationships with medical systems and local health departments to deliver clinical services and clinical trials in black barbershops and beauty salons. Our aim is to help more barbers and stylists complete state requirements to become certified community health workers. By embedding certified community health workers within black barbershops and beauty salons, we are more likely to have sustained engagement with medical and public health systems. Next slide. Incorporating our hyperlocal services into their reimbursement models, we desired community health workers to maintain their roots in the community where they have established a deep fund of goodwill, trust, and trustworthiness. Street credibility needed to help healthcare professionals navigate cultural nuances. So there's a silver lining in this pandemic from where I sit. Black communities continue to be hit hard by COVID-19. Scientists developed a vaccine in record time but you have seen the difficulty in getting that vaccine translated into vaccinations. So we pivoted our hair network, Health Advocates in Reach and Research, which was focused on health disparities, into a COVID-19 vaccination campaign with rapid response training of barbers and stylists using our online platform. On June 2nd, 2021, President Biden announced Shots at the Shop, a new initiative to engage Black-owned barbershops and beauty salons. Hair is the national model for Shots at the Shop. And to date, we have recruited more than 1,000 barbershops and beauty salons across the nation into the network. We are reaching the people at the hell no wall, individuals who would never be vaccinated otherwise. So in closing, when I think of the success of our work over the past two years, I come away with four truths. Number one, disinformation and misinformation is real. It's a game changer. It is well-organized, well-funded, and our communities are marinating in it. Number two, message is important, but also the messenger. Barbers and stylists are trustworthy messengers. They can be our partners. Number three, we need to learn from COVID-19 and codify these relationships and not let them go away as, they, as we head back to normal. And I'll finally say this, a message from the barbershops in the black and brown communities. Nobody wants to go back to normal because back to normal, far too many black and brown people live sicker and die younger. That's what I hope our conversation is going to be about, to sustain the successes of the pandemic and not let them go away uh, as we retreat in the name of back to normal. I'll send the floor back to you, Monica, and look forward to a robust conversation. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, uh, Dr. Shaw brought equity, innovation, and, and engagement as themes opening, and I, I see those very same themes coming across in um, your case study of the barbershops and um, hair salons being community health hubs. Um, so I want to thank all of our panelists for your critical insights, your provocative comments, your uh, proposed solutions. Um, I'd invite the audience again to uh, uh, offer uh, some questions up for our panelists to consider. And while those are getting teed up, I would like to ask our panelists to comment on 
um, Stephen called it this, uh, uh, the, the silver lining. What revolutionary potential do you think exists now that particularly since we've seen these creative collaborations um, between community health systems and public health systems uh, in order to uh, advance some equitable response to COVID-19. And then we also see unprecedented amounts of federal response and recovery resources uh, making their way throughout the country. So could I have each of you talk a little bit about the revolutionary potential you see in terms of our ability to stand up and sustain the type of infrastructure and workforces uh, that each of you has touched on in, in um, a variety of ways. Uh, Anita, I saw you nodding your head. Do you sure, mind yeah. this I mean, off? Yeah, I'm happy to jumpstart us. I'm not sure that anything yet is revolutionary at all. I don't see anything yet that's actually sustainable and integrated. Um, and, and the worry that I have, and I think it's good for discussion, is that there have been interesting investments, certainly from the executive branch. Certainly there has been a switch on for some conversations around systemic racism and, and structural inequity, but even surveys are showing sort of fading um, commitment to that. And so all of these efforts that we know, um, Stephen and others are exactly right. We know this of what sort of matters in community health and well-being. And yet we've not aligned incentives, governance, sort of the structural variables to actually transform in any meaningful, sticky way public health yet. Um, and so that's, that's what worries me is that we have promising actions. We have um, maybe some new insights for sure. And I think these are tremendous, but nothing that's sort of braided into the DNA yet. And, and to the sort of the sticky blueprint. And that's gonna, that's gonna require harder conversations about power. That's gonna require difficult conversations actually about inequity, not just disparity, the history and the structure really being unpeeled. And then a conversation about sort of political and social systems. And, and that's my worry is I'm not yet seeing these initiatives bear down in anything more than short lived. So, um, you know, if we're ready to have that conversation, then I think we've got to talk about incentives, governance, um, leadership representation, and a whole host of other variables. And, and communities aren't stupid. They know exactly what the, what the song is. Um, and I, I'd be looking out for those variables and factors that stick, but I'm curious what others think. So Monica, I, I, I would like to pick up off of Anita because I think I see a slight slice of silver. Um, and maybe Stephen would join in that song with me, but the very fact that communities themselves are doing something, they have ignited their own power. I hate the word empower. Communities have power and they're able, if properly supported, do even better. But many found, had to find those resilience and resources within themselves in order to meet the challenge, which was in this case COVID. I think my, um, Anita, the challenge here is to make sure that they're not uh, despreciado, as we say, they're not unappreciated, but in fact, they are woven into the system, not to become, not to be swallowed up by it, but to stand side by side equally and independently at the same time, all of us understanding what those health challenges are as defined by these individual communities with particular answers to systems we know how to do it, Re reinvest in us. And if we see movement, Stephen, on that end, as they become to trust us, <laughs> talk about two-way trust. Uh, we have not been trusted to have the answers for our own well-being. And so systems have to invest in showing that they do trust, we know. You do not have to have slews of P PhDs and MSs behind your name in order to show that you know what it's like and what you need to take care of your communities. Um, all overqualification can sometimes hide lack of understanding. So I think that there's opportunity here. What would you say, Stephen? Well, you know, you said, uh, I think Anita said the community is not stupid. I think we need to go to the community seeking their wisdom. We have no problem telling them what the problems are and defining their neighborhoods as food deserts and all kinds of things. 
that we don't have solutions for. So here's their wisdom. They'd seen me working on these health disparities, calling the hospitals, come out and do screenings, nobody returning the calls. COVID hits. Now they're calling me. Can we come into your barbershops? And you know what the barbers and stylists said to me, Anita? They said, are they just coming to give us the jab and leave us with cancer and diabetes and heart disease? That's our lesson. If we abandon these communities, if we, in the name of, okay, the resources are gone, gone back to whatever, we will have done more damage. Because trust means this, it's a calculated risk. I'm going to trust you. And you're going to do that to me again? Unacceptable. And out of this effort right here, there better be loud voices to make sure that doesn't happen. Or if it does, that a spotlight is put on it. Because these communities, our credibility across the board is on the line right now. If I, Monica, if I could just jump in and, and say, uh, completely agree with what my colleagues on the, on the panel have just said. I, I, the way I frame it is that there are two ways to end the pandemic. By the way, both will see the end of the pandemic. One is to be transactional in nature, and the other is to be transformational. Transactional essentially means that one and done, and you know, we as Americans are very good at we go to the next headline, the next shiny object, the next thing, and we, we forget everything that we went through collectively, the experiences, including, as Stephen uh, just so eloquently said, the wisdom of the community, and we, and we move on to the next thing. And the other is to be transformational, uh, which is really to say, what is collectively the experience and what were those gaps? And by the way, equity and inequities did not start with the pandemic, but yet it has been markedly accentuated and worsened by this pandemic. And yet, if we go back to a transactional way of looking at things, we will simply throw some money at it. We'll, we'll throw a few you know, health workers, a couple of small initiatives here or there, maybe large initiatives with lots of money, but we will not truly transform. And, and I think that's the challenge that we have is how do we really come together at a time when we have to acknowledge this, at a time that not everybody is on the same page. This is the big challenge is that it's one thing to say, we all have come together with those, you know, those fireside chats of way back when, and we're all you know, singing from the same you know, hymn book and we're all like, yes, let's do it. That is not where we are as a society right now. We have um, a, a political and a, and a power uh, tussle happening. And that means that we are going to be subject to a, a politicizing and a, and a football, if you will, from two different sides that really mean that ultimately community is, is where things will be forgotten. And I think it's shame on us if we don't learn those lessons. And unfortunately, oftentimes we don't. Hey, hey, Dr. Shaw, if a pandemic can't do it. So I say we leave it all on the field right now yeah. because this is truly it. Um, the retrenchment is happening as we speak. And a lot of the convening that the health departments did, I'm, I'm sure in Washington, you guys are going to be great. But a lot of the convening that the health departments did as they retreat, Nobody's calling the meetings anymore. You're literally leaving the people hanging out there. That is unacceptable. And we can't let that happen. And one other thing, how about those community benefit dollars? Who's actually monitoring how these systems are using that money to fill the very gaps that this pandemic has exposed? Who holds them accountable? I got an issue with that. They can't just pay themselves for uncompensated care and leave the burden in the community unresourced. You know, Stephen, I, 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 I'm sorry. Did you say Jeff? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just going to bring Jeff in um, on the issue of from transactional to transformational. Um, I'm wondering about sort of the reconstitution of the public health workforce and where does the uh, skill set, the strategies, the tactics for trust building how does that fit into um, sort of now and future competencies across the public health workforce 
and also for public health emergency preparedness and response in particular. I mean, whose whose job is it in public health to demonstrate trustworthiness? Um, if you could just speak to the to the workforce issues there, this was a question that came in from uh, the audience. I just want to make sure we get that out there. I, I totally agree that the, the building of trust really begins with the sharing of power. But with, with infrastructure and workforce, we must be be nimble and adaptive. We don't pick what we work on, it picks us. I think about how slow public health was in response to the opioid crisis, how slow we've been in responding to climate change adaptation and, and how public health really needs to prioritize the impacts of racism and inequity on health. But so much funding over the years has been categorical. I remember during H1N1, there were so many controls about what we could use the funding for. And, and so, much, so much of it was, was really not very helpful in addressing health in our communities. And so if, if funding is more flexible, uh, if folks are more able to say, listen to a community and the community says, this is what's important to us, this is what's happening here, this is something that we want to work with you on. There must be that flexibility in order to, to, to go do that. Not saying, sorry, my grant, my funding source is so narrow that I can only work on this. And that's why I, I'm forced to say, here's what I can work on. I can't work on what's important to you. Monica, please, I need to say this because I'm still yes. frustrated with Stephen. I'm still frustrated with <laughs> okay. Stephen. We have got to give our communities points for saving themselves. Community health workers have been around in our country for over 25 years. Broma Torres here in California have been around for 25 years. Uh, the National Association of Community Health Workers has been building their own competencies and their outreach and their ability to engage in the last 15 years. We recognize we cannot wait to be saved nor do we want to wait to be saved. We want to partner and engage. So if, the, so if there's the proper engagement and there's, then you can start to build that trust, but we can't wait. And even if they disappoint us again, Stephen, we're not gonna stop. <laughs> we can't just say, okay, look, we can't trust them. We're going to keep pushing. We're gonna get those small grants that we do things piece by piece by piece, but we're going to keep doing it because we need to help our communities rebuild from COVID and thrive based on new health issues that have arisen. And we hope that there are smart folks like Dr. Sean and Jeff and, and some of the other folk who are listening to recognize we've got to go in and build on those partnerships that we started to develop, build out because maybe they've already developed them and we need to have them at the table now to build out that long-term emergency plan. And for God's sake, please do not say, oh, we want to embed them inside our systems. No, you want to keep them out in those communities working with you because the minute you embed them, to me, they lose the very essence and the flavor of who they are, what they need to be and how they can be out in that community, identifying the issues that you want to address bringing them back to leadership and working together to resolve and address them. Um, I think that community health workers are that bridge, whether you call them promotores, whether you call them the barbershop team, you know. <laughs> uh, and in fact, Stephen, I was talking to my hairdresser and he told me in the 80s, the police department came to them and said, we want to help women who suffer domestic abuse. Can, you, can we train you to look for signs because you are the go-to people. And that's where they got engaged back in the 80s. So this, these, but we didn't learn, did that's we? Right. We didn't learn. And so we need to look at good community practices and see how they partner, <clears throat> excuse me, and work with us. All of the science in the world is not going to address public health issues. It's community to community, people to people, engagement to engagement, and the necessary dollars and investments to make sure that we're working equally in all of our communities to address our concerns. If I could add to that, and I agree with you, I, I think the other piece that maybe if we look back at, at the, the field of science or the field of medicine or even the field of public health is we also have to be better at, at what we are training our practitioners with the skill sets. And we're not there. And so I, I, I really truly believe part of the reason that we're where we are is because we felt that, look, we're the scientists and we're the public health practitioner, we're the doctor, just trust us. 
You know, you put on your white coat, just trust us. That's enough. So it may be science and evidence and where we start is necessary, but it is not sufficient. We must be better at engaging. And by the way, we have to keep reminding ourselves that we are of the community. And so when the middle of the pandemic and we were talking about childhood vaccinations and, and I had media ask me questions about the vaccinations for, for kids, I didn't answer the question first as the Secretary of Health. I didn't answer the question, secondly, as a, a public health practitioner, and I didn't ask answer the question, thirdly, as a physician. I answered the question as a member of the community, as a parent. And that's what we miss. And by the way, in my training as a physician, I was actually systematically told not to do that. I was told not to engage my individual patient, not to share my stories, that if I had a woman with breast cancer, I couldn't talk about my aunt who had breast cancer because it would be crossing the lines. That is a fundamental problem in our educational system. We've got to do a better job of training and being able to get those skill sets to the very practitioners so they are not just about science and evidence, but they're also about how do they engage and be part of the community because ultimately we are of the community as well. So I completely agree about promotoras and community health workers and barbershops and, and, and vaccine and implementation <laughs> and collaboratives and all the impact, whatever you want to call it. You are right. Power is in the community. We've got to be better at being part of that community as well. And we have failed. Uh, yeah, and Mayor, I, 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 oh, I'm sorry, Anita, we, we are no. at time. Okay. Um, and <laughs> there will be other other opportunities for the with the rest of the of the uh, of the work, and I knew you guys were going to be a fiery bunch. So <laughs> thank you, thank you for delivering uh, all the sparks. Um, so I would like to thank you for your remarks and uh, it, you know acute analyses of of where change is needed. Thank you to the public for your input and your questions. And Sandra, uh, if I could turn the floor over to you to close out our first day. Thank you, Monica. Sandra, Sandra, can I be so bold as to give you one last thing? I would recommend that anybody interested in understanding state-by-state -state overview of various things related to community health workers, that they look at a white paper just produced by the National Academy for State Health Policy. It's a state-by-state it's a -state review and perhaps people take a look at it because it does <clears throat> address reimbursement and certification, training, et cetera, et cetera. That's a good place to start. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Isabel.